So, when is the church going to reopen? The very fact that you're looking at this video reveals to me the fact that you have a very holy desire, a desire to want to again participate in the life of the church in our public worship. But like all holy desires, watch out, they can be hijacked by the evil one. Well, let me explain. You know, we go from, well, when is the church going to be open to the question, when are they going to allow us to go back to church? When are we going to be allowed to have mass again? Something is being deprived of me. I can feel the anger building. And then with that anger comes all kinds of other divisive thoughts and feelings that are not holy at all. As I say, the holy desire is in some way or another, it's hijacked by the evil one. I'm reminded of the scripture passage in Matthew's gospel when Jesus says, you know, if you're on your way to bring your gift to the altar, but find that you're, you have something against your brother, leave your gift at the altar. Go first and be reconciled with your brother. Then come and offer your gift. In other words, don't give the evil one the opportunity to hijack the holy desire through his weapons of divisiveness and anger. And I see it now as, you know, people are interpreting saying, well, the governor is keeping our churches closed and the president now has issued an executive order saying the governors are not allowed to um, close our churches, that we are essential. And what became a, a holy desire now devolves into a political debate. My friends, I cannot think that that is part of God's plan or even within his will for you. So with a peaceful heart, detached from divisiveness, anger, or any kind of political division, let's just simply ask the question, so when is church going to reopen? Well, in one sense, the church never really closed, if you think about that. I mean, the church is certainly more than just the building where we worship. The church is the community of faith where two or more are gathered in the name of Jesus, that Jesus is there. And we speak about the domestic church, the church of the family, where the family gathers in prayer, where the family gathers to mutually support and love each other, in the place where we are teaching and learning about our faith through our family. But that never closed. I hope to God it didn't close in your situation. Now we're continuing to keep the faith life alive in our families through participation in the virtual services we're able to offer through the live streamed masses or whatever way. There is no one formula here to be able to deepen faith in the, your own particular community. But as we look at the community of St. Bridget's, in one sense, also, our church hasn't closed. The church building has remained open as much as we can keep it open safely for the sake of sanitizing the church each time that it is opened, as well as the extension of outreach hours where a critical work of mercy in our church has never closed, that our outreach to the needy at this time so increased because of the pandemic that that particular work is still ongoing and even deepened because of our response to this particular situation. No, in many ways, the church has not closed. But the question in your heart is simply this. When are we going to be able to go back to Mass? When will we be able to sacramentally celebrate the great events in our life? Weddings, baptisms, confirmations, communions, etc. That too is a holy desire, the holy desire for Eucharist. And I'm so glad that that fire, that desire has not been extinguished in your heart. So let's look at that particular question. When will we begin again to have public mass in our churches and our places of worship? Now again, very clearly, the decision is made in consultation with medical experts and epidemiologists and all of those who know when it is safe for us to gather in numbers. And the church in Rockville Center, as well as other churches in our country, have been studying that question in consultation with medical 
experts and people in the field of epidemiology who know better than any one of us how we can safely expose ourselves to larger and larger gatherings. But these are some of the general guidelines I want to offer to you as what we know for sure. First of all, it's going to happen in stages. Well, what do I mean? Well, it's not going to be as we know in other areas of social life where we immediately turn on the switch and now all of a sudden we're back at the Easter vigil or the crowds that we have at Christmas. That's going not to happen immediately. We're going to have through various phases, um, stages of deeper and more uh, numbers of participation. That's for sure. But also to realize that in various stages, there are certain things that we're saying constantly throughout all of this. First of all, the obligation to attend Mass on Sunday, on the weekends, has been suspended at this time. So no one is obliged to go to church, to go attend Mass at this time. And that will extend pretty much through the various phases that are being developed right now of increased participation. Secondly, those people who in any way feel vulnerable, a part of a vulnerable population, whether because of age, whether because of pre-existing medical conditions or heightened sensitivities, uh, lowered immune systems, whatever, it doesn't matter. Those people who judge themselves to be in that vulnerable uh, population should not attend public worship at this time. It's not safe. Stay home. Participate in the ways in which we're able to make this available. And as an aside, the live streaming of Masses will continue throughout this whole process until everybody can be reunited at the table of the Lord, even those of a vulnerable population. So we want to make everybody assured that uh, whatever way you can participate, uh, we are going to make that available to you. The third thing, which obviously may not need to be stated, but it should be stated, is that in all of the phases of increased attendance or increased numbers, there will always be social distancing, the protocols of wearing face coverings when appropriate, and also probably the uh, absence of certain rituals that we've come used to, such as the handling of missalettes or worship aids, uh, vocal singing, which can increase perhaps um, the possibility of a viral spread uh, with loud singing or with projection of, of droplets. Those kind of things we have to place, uh, put in place so that we can ensure safety throughout all of the phases that will be initiated uh, for public worship. And then finally, and most importantly, patience, patience, patience. The Lord is working this out for all of us. And we want to be patient as each phase unfolds in the manner and time when it is appropriate as our spiritual leaders will be in consultation with medical experts to determine that we can now move forward at this time. Now, presently uh, in the Diocese of Brooklyn and in the Archdiocese of New York, they've been very specific right now in spelling out those various phases of increased participation. This much I can tell you what's been going on in Brooklyn and in New York, that they're looking at when the time is right, to begin to increase participation at baptisms, funeral liturgies, um, communion services perhaps, and then ultimately when public worship is going to be made available, perhaps as much as 50% of the area um, capacity of the particular worship space. That's Brooklyn and New York. What are we doing right now in Rockville Center? Well, again, things are changing. So this is Memorial Day weekend, and um, this is all we know right now. Right now, our diocese has given us permission to ha have worship with no more than 10 participants, including the celebrant and other ministers. 
So 10 or less may participate in a particular religious service, such as mass, such as baptism, wedding, uh, funeral liturgies. But again, that number 10 would also mean that lack of social, uh, that we would need to maintain social distancing and no Eucharist would be distributed at any of those liturgical services at this time. We still need to work out the protocol with regard to how communion can be safely distributed. So right now, services under 10 people, uh, no Eucharist would be permitted under any circumstances with the exception of obviously the emergency distribution of Eucharist to the dying. Um, so that is in place right now. Also, more importantly, the opportunity for the Sacrament of Reconciliation. Right now we're working out here at St. Bridget's how we can best make that sacrament available for people. It would again involve social distancing, especially with regard to the weight of where people would stand to wait for reconciliation. Could it be done outdoors? Uh, would it be done indoors? Whatever space we choose, there would still have to be that six feet of uh, necessary social distancing between the penitent and the uh, confessor, and where possible to make po uh, the, available the opportunity for anonymous confession that is behind a screen when, that is, uh, when that's possible. We're still working out the details of that here at St. Bridget's, and hopefully even by next weekend, will make the Sacrament of Reconciliation again available, uh, so stay tuned. Patience, patience, patience. I invite you to uh, consider again being connected to this parish as best as you can because we keep making these announcements and unless you connect with us, we can't get the information out. And I'm inviting you to be the ambassadors that will bring the news, good news, to people who are waiting uh, on these vital questions of reopening and re-engagement in our liturgy. But in the meantime, I thank you for sharing in this particular video with me now. And I ask that God will bless you and keep you safe, keep you well, keep you energized in your desire for Eucharist. And may the Lord protect you always. And may that blessing of Almighty God, who is Father, Son, Holy Spirit come upon you and remain with you forever and ever. Amen.